Hey there, scary story fanatics. Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. Ever turn around to find things aren't exactly what they seem to be? Ever dig too deep, vowing to keep to the shallows from now on? Well, don't be spooked by gruesome discovery just yet. Lock your doors and pull up your comfiest computer chair. It's time we explore yet another tale of the macabre. The Familiar. Well, I suppose I should start this off with providing you with a little bit of background on myself. My name is Stephen. Ever since I was a child, I was always interested in the paranormal and supernatural. As a child, with no internet, I had to rely on books and tales passed down by generations in order to investigate these things that fascinated me. As I got older, obtaining a job and a car, I was able to explore areas more remote than the woods of my backyard. I investigated Bigfoot in the hills of the Appalachians, camping out, playing recordings of supposed calls, and beating on trees with sticks in order to entice a possible reply. I've explored supposed haunted estates with all the proper equipment. I even traveled to Lake Champlain trying to catch a glimpse of the Loch Ness-like monster, Champ. Each attempt was met with failure, as I never did gather anything of any kind of substantial evidence. This all changed when I moved out west for a career as a well-compensated surgeon. Sure, my job keeps me plenty busy, but without a family to care for, I still have more free time than one might expect. So, obviously, I continue my favorite pastime during my free time that I have. It wasn't long before a friend of mine referred me to an older gentleman by the name of Philip Dobson. Taylor was the friend that referenced me to this man. I had told him of my fascination with the unusual and told him of all my unfruitful experiences during the few weeks that we had been working together. Taylor told me of an old friend of his father's that always told this same story to him and his father's friends quite frequently. He told me to go into it with skepticism, but that I would probably enjoy the story anyway. I agreed to the proposition, and Taylor told me he would make the arrangements. I remember thinking that this seemed like a step backwards, as I was resorting to another passed down story, but I decided to follow the lead either way, because as I said before, he would make it for an opportune time, and I would have nothing else much to do. Saturday morning arrived with a happy glow. It was absolutely cliche, as the birds were chirping and children could be heard playing in the street outside. Taylor had made the appointment to meet the older man later in the evening, so I passed the day performing daily chores, such as mowing the lawn and painting the north wall of my newly refinished bathroom. When six o'clock rolled around, I promptly cleaned up and readied myself. Taylor would be there by seven. I was to follow him there, be introduced, and afterwards, Taylor would leave me there as he had a pre-existing obligation to fulfill, taking his wife out for their date night. This typically consisted of a cheap meal at the local diner and a black and white movie presented in their living room to be enjoyed from the comfort of their couch. He insisted, though, that she enjoyed the weekly ritual so much that she would be deeply upset if Taylor stood her up. Anyway, Taylor arrived at five, and we punctually entered our vehicles. Taylor pulled out from the drive, and I followed closely behind. Old Phil's house was on the outskirts of town, up in the rising hills to the east. We stopped along the way to fill Taylor's gas tank. I grabbed a Red Bull. Distance and stops included, it only took about 45 minutes to arrive at the base of Phil's driveway. I remember thinking how beautiful yet overtaken the place seemed. It was well out of the way of the bustle of the city below, and natural flora decorated the front landscape. However, 
the little log cabin, seemed quite old, and the man certainly had become accustomed to country living, as an old wash tub and his clothesline was boasted in the front yard, about fifteen feet from the front door. The sun was getting low in the sky, giving the horizon behind the house a pinkish tone, lending its pigment to the greenery and brown cabin ever so softly. As we pulled in place, placed our cars in the park position, an old man garbed in all denim fabrics proceeded out through his now opening front door. Taylor was the first to open his door and leave the driver's seat. Hey, Phil! Taylor exclaimed, placing his hand high above his head so as to accompany his verbal greeting with its corresponding gesture. Phil responded with the same, and it was then that I felt at ease enough to leave the confines of my own vehicle. I approached the man, slowly extending my hand as I trotted so as to initiate a warm hello, when I noticed the outstanding features of him. His hair was long and shaggy, mixed with the colors of deep brown and white, like the way a snowbank back east looked after a plow had gone by. His face was vividly scarred on the right side and distinctly highlighted by a glistening glass eye. The flesh of his right jaw seemed pitted, almost chipped, and the scars disappeared out of sight beneath the collar of his denim shirt. He wasn't a very tall man. He stood about the same height as me, and I'm measured at five foot eight. This allowed for profound eye contact as he extended his hand to greet mine. As we said our hellos and nice to meet yous, I desperately attempted to keep eye contact with only his left eye so as to not offend him. I'm pretty sure I did a good job, as he never seemed to exhibit any negative words or body movements as we introduced ourselves. I remember thinking he seemed to hold an abysmal sadness in the depth of his good eye. Taylor quickly proceeded to thank Phil for taking the time to sit with me and tell me his tale, and reminded us both of his obligation to his wife. After we both watched Taylor back out of the driveway, into the road, and drive from sight, Phil invited me into his home, and the two of us walked and chatted as we crossed the threshold inside. Phil led me through the what could be described as the mudroom, which is a room that one walks into from the outside of the home. This room is typically used in most homes for keeping shoes, jackets, and other various outdoor apparel. Besides the random paint bucket and animal feed, Phil used the room for pretty much the same purposes. The living room was the next area on the tour, which was also where the tour ended. He wasn't being rude, rather I gather he assumed that I had taken the time from my busy schedule to hear his story and wanted to accommodate me as soon as possible. I don't know what you're hoping to gain from this, he told me. I gave him the same background regarding my experiences that I've told you. He nodded as I spoke, signaling comprehension. He then asked if I wouldn't mind having a seat on the couch, and asked me if I maybe would like a cup of coffee before we began. After he went into the kitchen to prepare the pot of coffee, he sat in a chair across from the coffee table in front of me and made small talk while the coffee brewed. We had completely exhausted the topic of the weather by the time the coffee pot had signaled it had finished percolating. As he sauntered into the kitchen, I noticed the thick and inviting smell of coffee aromas wafting through the air. He returned with the coffee mug exactly how I told him I like it. No cream, no sugar. He sat at his appointed seat once again, sipped his coffee, and sighed as he placed the mug on the end table beside the chair. I suppose you're here to hear about the familiar, he stated. The familiar? I inquired. Never in all my explorations and research did I ever hear of anything called a familiar. Yes, the familiar. At least that's what I call it. I'm not really sure what it was. I remained silent, and Phil began. Well, I guess I should start from the beginning. This all happened when I was a boy. I was 17, and me and a girl by the name of Charlotte, who was my girlfriend at the time, 
and two of my guy friends, Joey and Todd, went camping in the woods about 30 miles from here. Back then, the area I'm talking about was close to each of our homes. Times were different back then, and parents usually had no issue with their children going camping in the woods overnight, except for Charlotte. She wasn't allowed to go because she was a girl and we were all boys. However, Charlotte had a friend cover for her one night so she could sneak out with us anyway. My mother insisted that I bring my dog, a big black lab by the name of Butch, but I really didn't feel like dealing with a dog while I was out there, as I knew my girlfriend would be there, and I was thinking only about focusing all my attention on her. I packed up my things after school and headed out to meet Joey and Todd at our daily rendezvous point, an abandoned gas station located about a mile from where I was living. As I neared the end of my hike down the wooded mile, I spied Joey and Todd leaned against the abandoned building on the right-hand side of the road. The building was comprised of dirty white cement blocks whose paint had been chipping, revealing the stone gray beneath. The pavement that encompassed the structure was cracked and heaved throughout, while the trees attempted to regain the former space, which used to occupy the area, by extending their branches like arms, reaching ever so closely to the chipped walls. We hung around waiting for Charlotte, as she would likely be there within the hour. So, to pass the time, Todd asked us if we both wanted to smoke a joint. Of course, being teenagers in the woods with nothing to do, we said yes, as both Joey and I were avid marijuana smokers. Stoners is what I believe you call it now. Anyway, not long after we lit our post-high cigarettes, did Charlotte come walking around the corner. She was a short girl, red hair and green eyes that were, unfortunately, encased in what we always picked on her for, librarian-like glasses. Although we did poke at her about it, she knew she was beautiful, and she knew everyone else thought so too. It didn't take her more than two glances at me to scold me for smoking without her. Todd quickly rolled another one so as to bring her up to speed. We only hiked through the woods for about 20 minutes before we decided that we were in deep enough to make camp. Since Charlotte and I were staying in the same tent, we finished much earlier than Joey and Todd, so we decided to take a walk to a nearby stream that we knew of, leaving Joey and Todd to finish setting up their overnight accommodations. Of course, my two buddies joked about us strolling off together, but I'm pretty sure she only wanted to pass some time, and I knew that she would have no part of making it in the dirt beside the running water. We sat for a few minutes before I asked her if she would like to smoke a joint, just the two of us. You have weed? I remember her asking. I nodded with a smirk and pulled a sandwich bag with a corner full of some marijuana shake. I took a pinch and rolled a moderate-sized joint as I hoped to get her pretty high. This is where things started to get weird. I told her that I had to take a whiz real quick, and that we would spark it when I got back. I walked into the woods about 25 to 30 feet so as to make sure that I was far enough from sight. Yeah, I know. I'm one of those guys who like privacy. I unzipped behind a tree and started to go. And when I looked up, there was a naked woman standing with her back to me, about 30 feet away, leading further into the woods. Keep in mind that this is summertime, about 6.30ish at the latest, so the lighting allowed for a really good view. I could see it clearly, so I mean it did look like a girl. It had long black hair growing down to the center of its back. It had a curved body like that of a young woman. I watched her for a moment, waiting for her to turn around, but she did not move. After a few seconds, I yelled out, Hey, can I help you? I mean, this was a naked girl in the middle of the freaking woods. I figured she probably needed help. She turned her head ever so slightly, not enough for me to see her face, and then, like, skittered off, like a bug or something. The thing was, she stayed on two feet and her movement seemed jerky and clearly awkward. I may have been able to follow it, but honestly, I was too terrified to even consider such an action. 
Its movements alone were nothing short of unhinging, like it was unnatural. I backed away from the scene slowly, and turned once I felt at ease enough to leave my back facing the direction I had just seen that thing. I jogged back to Charlotte and told her of the incident. All she seemed to hear was, I was watching, and naked girl. She stormed off in a huff, throwing the joint in the creek. I followed her back to camp, and when I got there I saw that she was nowhere in sight. I asked Joey and Todd where she'd gone, and they replied with, She went in the tent, and she looked pretty mad. They asked me what I had done, throwing all kinds of obvious jokes into the mix. I told them of my little experience, and it only made their adolescent joking increase, with all kinds of naked woman jokes being tossed in. I'm pretty sure this made Charlotte even more upset, as I'm positive that she could hear us. I was so mad that no one would believe me. I tried talking to Charlotte again, but only succeeded in removing her anger and replacing it with the same immature humor exhibited by Joey and Todd. At this point, I gave up, but I still felt really uneasy. It wasn't until later that night, while we were huddled by a raging fire and surrounded by an inky blackness, that the thing decided to come back. It started when we all heard a shrill voice, or scream in the distance of the woods, towards the creek. I'll try to describe it. It sounded like a howl, but really high-pitched and scratchy, like a growl. That's pretty much as close as I can define it. After I noticed that everyone had fallen completely silent and still, the only thing I remember thinking was, finally, at least now they'll believe me. Looking back now, though, I really wish I was more concerned and forced us all to leave earlier. When I had my first encounter, I really, really do. All of us guys wanted to go look after a while, but no one felt comfortable leaving Charlotte alone, who was genuinely scared now, unwilling to go investigate. So, we all decided that I would stay behind and Joey and Todd would go look instead. They were only gone two, maybe three minutes, which seemed like forever due to the utter silence. And that's another thing. The silence. I ain't heard any kind of silence like that in my life, except for that night. Anyway, we listened. Quiet. Then a blood-curdling scream from what had to be taught. I then finally understood what that term meant. Blood-curdling. Charlotte and I looked up at each other in horror, remaining absolutely silent when we heard a distinct tearing and popping sound happening at the same time, followed by another gripping scream of terror from what I assumed to be Joey. We heard a snap, and then silence. We were young, really scared, and panicking. We really couldn't think of what to do for a while. We were deciding on, should we go look? Should we leave them behind, hiking back the mile-plus terrain in the pitch dark to the nearest help? Should we hide and remain silent in our tent? We finally chose to walk back through the woods, down the road to my house, and tell the first adult we could find. We left the camp and began to walk. We hadn't made it to the gas station when we saw it. I, again. A naked girl. About 30 feet away. Facing away from us. This time it was really dark and difficult to make out, but the moonbeams shone through the canopy sparsely landing on the forest floor, illuminating only enough for a vague outline of the monstrosity before us. Charlotte turned to ask me, Is this what you saw? With a whisper so as to not attract the attention of the creature. It didn't work. The thing abruptly scuttled towards us, in the same fashion that it had fled from me before, only this time it moved backwards, remaining to face away from us. I don't know why, or even how I did it, but I slowly reached out my hand to touch it. When I did, 
It turned to look at me, changing body form in an instant. I mean, one moment, its back is toward me, presenting a naked woman with black hair, and the next, its fuzz on its body seems to stand up and turn black, tinting its appearance, but sparse enough to still allow sight to the skin beneath. Its arms had grown long, sporting distinct extensive spines or tendrils protruding from the backs of its elbows, knuckles almost to the ground. I mean, this happened in the blink of a second. But the worst was its face. When it turned, its head was that of a big black dog or coyote. Yeah, almost like that, a coyote, except it had two yellow, lemur-like eyes that seemed at least twice as big as they should have been, given the parameters of the skull. It had a coarse, jet-black fur covering the entirety of its deformed skull. Its upper jaw seemed locked into a snarl position, bearing long, brownish-white teeth, while its lower jaw hung slightly slack, hanging open, still, and eerie. I and Charlotte were obviously taken by surprise and subsequently paralyzed by fear. In another blink of a moment, it touched me, and I collapsed. As I fell, I remember Charlotte releasing a loud shriek that was cut very short. I'm pretty sure the thing touched her, too. Have you ever encountered sleep paralysis? I've been introduced to this topic since this happened to me, and it sounds very similar. I won't go off on a tangent, but it's when you can't move or even control your breathing, but you're aware, awake, and can very much feel everything. That's what it was like. I laid on the ground amongst the leaves and twigs, my head cocked to the left so as to be looking directly at Charlotte. She had her head cocked to the right and was staring right at me. I don't know if we had landed that way or if the creature did it intentionally, but it doesn't matter. What happens next is a little difficult for me to get through. Phil takes a break, and I remain silent. It bent down, sniffing at me, its arms laying lazily upon the ground. Its large, bright yellow eyes seemed more malevolent, almost insane like the thing had a giant set of googly eyes, holding a sinister yet energetic revelry in the slaughter that was imminent to ensue. It stood up abruptly, turning its head with the same jerky skitter movement, lifted its long right arm, and began to furiously bite and gnaw on itself. It left a mass of mutilated flesh dangling from the right-hand side of its body, only made more terrifying by the fact that it had done it in the matter of an instant, and it should have taken at least a few seconds. It leaned over close once more, thick, dark blood dripping from its dangling maw. Its breath smelled rancid, like that of what I imagined to be a month-old corpse. I couldn't even hold my breath, as all my movements were halted by this mysterious effect. Slime oozed from its mouth as it slowly moved from me and inched towards Charlotte, sniffing the ground all the way. It stopped right over top of her. I was about three feet away, but I could not move. As it leaned over her, jaw slack and dangling, it vividly lent a side profile of whatever this thing was. I could only see one large yellow eye now, as it twitched and moved about like that of a fisheye, finally resting to meet my paralyzed gaze. I only broke gaze with the thing when I saw a single tear trickle from Charlotte's eye. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. I couldn't do anything. I guess it had its fun, because in the next moment it began the furious feeding and biting that had begun on itself on Charlotte's right arm. Sounds of ripping flesh, bones popping, and chewing could be heard. But nothing else. No crickets. No beetles. No screams. No cries. 
just the putrid sounds of flesh and bone being ripped apart and eaten. I know she could feel everything, because I could distinctly feel everything too. The crisp air on my skin, the tears rolling down my face, and the warmth on my skin that accompanied them. I dreaded to imagine what she'd have been feeling. After what seemed like an hour, the sounds finally stopped, and although she was still not moving, I could tell that life had left her due to the icy stare in her eyes. When it stood up, that's when I noticed it. A rustling. Another rustling. I reeled back at the thought of more of these things. It stood over me, watching me. As it did, I was able to make out the rustling that approached me in Charlotte's body. Animals. All kinds of carnivorous animals began to crowd around the creature and began to feast upon Charlotte's dripping remains that gave off a slight steam in the crisp, cool night air. The creature had not moved. Bugs, wolves, even a bobcat were all feeding on Charlotte's flesh, but the creature remained over me, just staring at me. Just when I began to think that it may leave me alone, it plunged forward as it had earlier and began to tear up my abdomen. Its claws reached up and clawed at my face. I'm pretty sure that this is where the thing tore out my right eye. Phil pointed at his face. It took a couple fingers, too. A feature I, Stephen, did not notice until Phil presented his left hand. I just lay there. Unable to move, but able to feel every last thing. I thought I would die, but after it ravaged my body, it scuttled off into the night. When it did, the rest of the forest life began to nibble at my wounds as well. The pain was, well, indescribable. I imagine it's a lot like what hell would feel like. I don't know how long I laid there. But it must have been a while, because the sky had already turned from pure black to a darkened gray, when I heard a dog in the distance. I knew right away who it was. Every boy knows the sound of his dog. Sure enough, Butch had found me and was barking at the animals surrounding me. It was only for a moment because each forest resident quickly scampered off. And that's when I blacked out. I awoke in the hospital about three days later, I guess. I was told that Butch had gotten loose and my parents were performing a search and rescue for the dog. Apparently, they heard his barks while investigating the abandoned gas station. When they followed him, they found Butch. Beside him was mine in Charlotte's mutilated bodies. I was then told that I was the only one who made it. Joey and Todd were found torn apart, very similarly attacked as Charlotte and I. When I was asked what had happened, I told them this story. They tried to convince me that it was a bear or something, and that my hysteria must have created the whole creature thing. I thought about getting them to examine the marks on the bodies, but I was quickly reminded that it looked like an animal, and likely left animal wounds that appeared as if they were made by nothing more than typical hungry forest life. I eventually concurred, as I knew that no one would believe me anyway. But I know what I saw. My mother told me how lucky I was to have Butch, and that he was like a familiar. It's a familiar? I asked. She answered by telling me a familiar is an animal in which you share a mystical, almost magical bond. Although this was intended to remind me of my faithful black lab, it reminded me of that thing, the way the animals surrounded it. So, that's what I call it, the familiar. But like I said, 
not really sure what it's actually called. Well, that's it. That's my story, and that's why I look so pretty. I really didn't know what to say. I chatted with Phil for a while, about some of my experiences some more, trying not to force the man to linger on this painful memory. I don't think it worked, however, as Phil's story could not be shaken from my thoughts. It was getting late, and I had to get going. After a pleasant, short goodbye, I made my way to and through Phil's front door. This is why I don't investigate the supernatural or paranormal anymore. When I got to my car and went to open the driver's side door, I caught a glimpse of something in the tree line, about 30 feet away, on the other side of my car. It had gotten pitch black outside by now, but I could tell. It was a naked woman with her back to me. She had long, black hair that grew to the center of her back. Nothing made a noise. Not a cricket or the wind. Everything was silent. I stared in awe, only for a moment, before I opened the door. It just stood there, motionless, and I climbed in and shut the door as softly as I could. It wasn't until I started the engine that it turned to look at me. It was exactly as Phil had described, a black coyote-like head covered in jet black fur, and those eyes. I will never forget those eyes. I don't think it followed me as I speedily pulled from Phil's drive. I hurried away, vowing never to dig into the unknown again. Some animals aren't meant to be pets, and if they follow you home, well, that may be just because you look tasty. But if you're ravenous for more gore galore, make sure to come back again next weekend. And until then, remember to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications so I can catch you all again next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs>